You are listening to Lighthearted, the official podcast of the United States Lighthouse Society. My name is Jeremy Dontremont. Welcome. My co-host today is Cindy Johnson, Operations Manager of Friends of Portsmouth Harbor Lighthouses. Hi, Cindy. Hello, Jeremy. This is episode 86 of Lighthearted, slated for October 26, 2020. On October 26, 1936, the first electric generator at the Hoover Dam went into full operation. And on October 26, 1977, smallpox was officially eradicated. Born on October 26, 1973, was the American writer, actor, and singer Seth MacFarlane. He once said, quote, the only problem is time, unquote. I'm not sure it's the only problem, but it's definitely part of what makes so many things in life a challenge. And speaking of time, today we're going to talk about a lighthouse that desperately needs to be rescued before the forces of nature destroy it forever. Later, we're also going to have another installment of Photo Tips with Mike Leonard. But first, we're going to talk about the Harbor of Refuge Lighthouse in Delaware. And our guest is Rick Ziegler, president of the organization that owns the lighthouse. Cindy, please help me tell our listeners about Harbor of Refuge Lighthouse. Sure, Jeremy. In 1825, an act of Congress authorized the building of a breakwater off of Cape Henlopen in Delaware to create a protected harbor. The breakwater wasn't completed until 1869. The harbor that was created wasn't deep enough to accommodate the new, larger ships of the U.S. Navy, so another breakwater was built about one and a quarter miles north of the original one. The new harbor that was created was called the National Harbor of Refuge. In 1907, a lighthouse at the southern end of the outer breakwater went into service. The hexagonal wooden tower was 52 feet high. It was moved off its foundation by storms in 1918 and 1920, and it was deemed uninhabitable and was dismantled by the lighthouse service. In November 1926, a new Harbor of Refuge lighthouse was established. The white cast iron tower built in 1926 is 76 feet tall. The cast iron caisson base is built into the breakwater. The tower was built to withstand major storms and it has been tested many times by hurricanes and other severe weather. The lighthouse was automated in 1973 and the Coast Guard crew was removed. After some years of neglect, there was a major renovation in the late 1990s. The Delaware River and Bay Lighthouse Foundation was founded in 1999 by author and preservationist Bob Trapani Jr and Dan McFadden, a former Coast Guard lighthouse keeper. The new organization became the steward for Harbor of Refuge Lighthouse and a lease was signed with the Coast Guard in 2002. Then in September 2004, ownership of the lighthouse was transferred to the organization under the guidelines of the National Historic Lighthouse Preservation Act. The breakwater on which the lighthouse stands has deteriorated badly. In 2007, Congress appropriated funds for a study of the breakwater. The U.S. Army Corps of Engineers awarded a contract for nearly $3 million in repairs to the breakwater wall under and near the lighthouse, and the work was carried out in 2011. In recent years, the breakwater and the concrete base of the lighthouse have continued to deteriorate. About 70% of the rocks around the base has been lost. The channel between the lighthouse and Cape Henlopen has gotten narrower, resulting in a faster current and deeper water. Lighthouse tours conducted by the Delaware River and Bay Lighthouse Foundation have been offered seasonally with the exception of this year because of the COVID-19 pandemic. The group's volunteers have done much maintenance at the lighthouse, including a repainting this year. Rick Ziegler is the president of the Delaware River and Bay Lighthouse Foundation. Rick lives in Lancaster, Pennsylvania, but Lewis, Delaware is his second home. He's long had a fascination with lighthouses, and he got his first tour of Harbor of Refuge Light in 2004. He became a member of the Delaware River and Bay Lighthouse Foundation that day. He started going on volunteer work trips in 2009. He became a board member in 2012 and became president in 2019. I had a chance to speak with Rick Ziegler in late September. Let's listen to that conversation now. I am speaking with Rick Ziegler, who is the president of the Delaware River and Bay Lighthouse Foundation. Thank you so much for being with me today, Rick. Glad to be here. I hope it's as nice today down in Delaware as it is here on the New Hampshire seacoast. 
Yes, it's beautiful here as well. We're in late September as we record this. People will be hearing this actually in late October, but we are recording on September 21st. So, Rick, let me uh, start by asking you, how did you get involved personally with the Lighthouse? Well, uh, actually, uh, I've been interested in the Lighthouse since a high school trip to Lewis, Delaware. I had my first tour in 2004. Uh, We were vacationing in Lewis, and I just happened to pick up a newspaper and saw an advertisement for Lighthouse tours. And I called them, and one was leaving in about two hours. So I hustled on over and got to get my first tour that day. Uh, It was a great experience, and I became a member uh, of the foundation that day. Um, I started volunteering on work trips to Harbor Refuge Light in 2009 and uh, became uh, a board member in 2012 and uh, just became president last year. You know, I realized that a couple of minutes ago I asked you how the weather is down in Delaware, but you actually live in Pennsylvania. Is that correct? I do. I live in Lancaster. Uh, Lewis is uh, my second home. So if we could, let, let's talk a little bit about the history of Harbor of Refuge, uh, the breakwater itself and the lighthouse. What can you tell me about the breakwater system that was built in the uh, the 19th century to create a Harbor of Refuge near Cape uh, Henlopen? Yeah, uh, interest in building a breakwater and creating a, a harbor uh, for ships to dock in storms actually began in ni- uh, 1822. Lewis was chosen uh, over uh, a couple of other sites because of its proximity to the ports of Philadelphia and Wilmington. In 1826, uh, architect William Strickland uh, was hired to uh, plan the building of the structure. And that began in 1828 and was not finished until 1869. It took 41 years to build. One interesting note, this uh, harbor Breakwater was the first public works project of the United States government, and it's also the first of its kind in the Western Hemisphere. Very unique and very forward-thinking for something that happened 200 years ago. Yeah, well, that's really interesting. So let's talk about the the lighthouse itself now, the Harbor of Refuge Lighthouse. One of the things uh, I've certainly read about a lot there over the years is stories of big storms uh, and how they've affected the lighthouse and its resident keepers. Are there any stories along those lines that really stand out for you? Well, the the first Harbor Refuge light went into operation in 1908. It was uh, a wooden octagonal structure, very beautiful, but uh, they quickly learned that wood is not a good environment for that location. And uh, There were a couple of bad storms in 1920, and each one of them moved the light an inch off its base. So uh, eventually in 1925, they decommissioned it. That's when they decided to build the new Harbor of Refuge light out of steel. There's other stories. Uh, 1929, uh, the keepers reported that waves crashed into the, the second level of the lighthouse, which is more than 40 feet above the water can imagine that was the sleeping quarters, because you can imagine how nerve-wracking that must have been. My, my favorite uh, story about the light actually goes back to the first Harbor of Refuge light. Uh, there was a, a keeper named Thomas Moore. It was December, and uh, he was due to rotate off duty and go home. It was uh, right before Christmas, and he wanted to spend the holidays with his family. The problem was it was a very cold December, and they weren't uh, able to send the boat out for him because the harbor was frozen, uh, which is very unusual. It, it, it was just a very cold year and it happened to be frozen. So he was determined to get home. So he walked from the lighthouse to land and, and followed land the rest of the way to his house, made it home for Christmas. I know that story because uh, Mr. Moore was the grandfather of one of our current board members. Oh. She always loves to tell that story. Huh. Oh, that's yeah. great. That's great yeah. to have that, that personal connection in your organization as well. That's always Yes, absolutely. Yeah, that's a, that's a great story. So speaking of your organization, let's move more to recent history and the, and the present day. Your organization, the Delaware River and Bay Lighthouse Foundation, has actually owned Harbor of Refuge Lighthouse since 2004. And I believe the dock was basically built or rebuilt not long after that, and public tours got going. This season was lost because of the pandemic. 
as is true for most lighthouses in this country. But I'm wondering if you have plans to resume those tours once uh, the situation improves, which, hope, which hopefully will be next year. Yeah, we're, we're hopeful next year things will get more back to normal um, and we'll follow our typical schedule. We normally do two tours back to back on uh, one Saturday each month from June through September. Tell me what happened with the old DCB-36, uh, what some people refer to as an aero beacon type optic that is now on display at the lighthouse. I understand it was basically salvaged from the trash. Is that right? Pretty much. Uh, when, when the current light uh, went into operation in 1926, it had a, a fourth order Fresnel lens with an oil vapor lamp. Uh, the DCB-36 aero beacon was installed in 1947. And when it was replaced with the current optic in 1996, uh, they took the old light apart and just left the pieces on the floor in the watch room, just uh, directly below the lantern room. So when the foundation uh, took over in 2002, volunteers brought all those pieces down to the third level and uh, just spent an afternoon putting it back together. And now it's on display as a museum piece. Oh, that's <laughs> neat. Yeah. Good thing it wasn't yeah. just tossed into the ocean or something. Yeah, yeah, it's a it's a part of history. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. People <laughs> think of the the old Fresnel lenses, the classic Fresnel lenses, as being so historic, and they are. But mm -hmm. uh, things like that DCB optic are now uh, fading into history. So it's, it's important to preserve those things and, and show them to the public. Absolutely, mm -hmm. absolutely. Mm -hmm. yeah. What? Uh, just remind me, what is the optic in the lighthouse today? It is a Vega VRB25. Yeah, those are pretty common, rotating acrylic light. I'm wondering, has there been any talk of uh, changing that to an LED, like it's been done at so many offshore lighthouses? Uh, it's interesting you mentioned that because I, 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 a while back I did some research on the light itself and uh, said it had a 20-year lifespan. I thought they're probably due for that soon. We haven't heard, uh, but it is an active aid to navigation. So uh, the uh, Coast Guard does come in about twice a year to service it. So we'll just wait to hear from them to see if they're going to replace it. I think it's a good idea. It's solar powered, so um, LED would, would be a good option. Like I said, a lot of the offshore lighthouses, especially I know in within New England, certainly where I am, the majority of offshore lighthouses have been switched to the what they call the VLB44 optic, which is also made by the Vega company, and they, you know, they require very little service and they're relatively inexpensive. So they and they 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 create a very bright light as well. Let's talk about your volunteers. Uh, what what sort of work do your volunteers do and I think I've seen uh, mention in press that they actually do some hands-on work, like actually painting the lighthouse. Yeah, by far that is our biggest task. Um, the exterior of the light is pounded by waves almost daily, so we do have to uh, paint the exterior every year, especially the caisson. Um, but uh, there are some other specific things. Uh, we'll, we'll get... Uh, a few years ago, we had um, a welder come out. He donated his time and equipment. He came out and repaired the door to the watch room for us. Uh, occasionally, we'll have uh, an electrician come out and do some wiring work for us. But yeah, it uh, primarily is painting. It's something we have to do over and over again on the outside. Can you do all the painting on the exterior as well with volunteers, or does some of that need to be done by a contractor? No, uh, so far we've uh, managed with volunteers. We have a, a strong group of volunteers that comes out routinely, and we usually get it done every year. Oh, that's great. Every year? Oh, that's that's impressive. Yeah, it's uh, you'd be surprised. We, we, we leave the light at the end of the season, and, you know, we come back in the spring, and there's rust and everything all over the place. It, mm -hmm. You know, it's like, well, going to start all over again. You're never done, that's for sure. Never done. So the lighthouse, Harbor of Refuge Lighthouse, stands on a concrete base at the end of a stone breakwater. And as I mentioned a few minutes ago, your organization owns the lighthouse. But uh, I'm not quite clear on who actually owns the breakwater. Uh, the breakwater is owned by the federal government, actually. And the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers is responsible for maintenance. There were some repairs to the breakwater about, I think it was about 10 years ago. Is that is that? Accurate? Yeah. It is. Uh, 2011 
the summer and into the fall of 2011, uh, they replaced many of the 10 to 12 ton stones that had fallen off, uh, even um, using rebar to reinforce them. Unfortunately, many of them have washed away already, and uh, we're back to where we were. And actually, it's a little worse than it was before because there's additional stones that are uh, that we've lost uh, just in the last year. Is there any reason why the damage to the breakwater has, seems to have accelerated in recent years? Yes. What we believe is causing it is Cape Henlopen is the nearest landmass to, to the breakwater, and it is growing. And as it grows closer to the breakwater, the channel for water to enter from the Atlantic Ocean into Delaware Bay is getting smaller. So the water is traveling faster, and that's um, causing the, the bottom to get scoured out. According to the uh, Army Corps, it's uh, 120 feet deep at the deepest point now, just off the breakwater. And when it was completed in 1901, it was only 50 feet. It's more than doubled in depth. So that, that's creating much stronger currents that are causing the damage. I wonder if in increasingly bad storms that we seem to be getting, they certainly don't help either. They don't. Yes, that's true. I was reading that your foundation is working with the Army Corps of Engineers to come up with a plan for uh, some new repairs to the breakwater. So what's, what's the latest news on that? Well, over the last few years, they've been doing annual underwater sonar surveys of, of the breakwater. They just did one about a month ago. And we got the results about two weeks ago. The good news is the breakwater below the water line is holding up well. There's not too many changes, um, but we are losing a lot of those 10 ton stones on the top. And it's very concerning because it's the ones closest to the lighthouse that helps form the foundation to anchor the lighthouse one to uh, the breakwater. So uh, there's no firm plans for what they're going to do to fix it yet. It's uh, they're looking at a lot of different ideas, but um, it, it takes years for them to plan and budget for projects like this. So we're just hoping to get in the queue fast because we don't want it to go too long. So uh, I believe the repairs you talked about that took place around 2011 cost in the neighborhood of $3 million. Is that, is that right? It was about $3 million. Mm -hmm. So do you have some idea what, what kind of price tag you're looking at for the, these repairs that are needed? They're, they're talking it could be $10 million or more. They're, it's, uh, yeah, unless they come up with some really innovative approach that no one's thought of yet. So, uh, yeah, it's, uh, <laughs> it's going to be a struggle getting that money. So that's why we're asking them to plan now. Yeah. It's, uh, daunting is uh, an understatement when you talk yes. about yeah. that, that big a project and that kind of money. Uh, <laughs> so let's talk about the, get away from the breakwater a little bit and talk about the, the lighthouse a bit more. Uh, what is the current condition of the lighthouse structure itself? Uh, we uh, had a new dock built in, uh, it was finished in November of 2016. And the first thing we did when we went out in 2017 was bring uh, some structural engineers to do an assessment. And uh, they did a very thorough job with that. And uh, we were happy to, to see that the lighthouse itself is in very good condition. There are some things that we need to fix, but nothing uh, urgent, uh, nothing that would prevent us from going out there and working at the light or bringing tour guests out. So. So that's some good news. It's uh, that the lighthouse is very well built and it's holding up well for being almost 94 years old. I just want to mention that your organization, the Delaware River and Bay Lighthouse Foundation, was founded back in 1999, uh, co-founded by a good friend of mine, Bob Trapani Jr. Yes, and, yes, I know Bob. <laughs> yeah, who is uh, yep. now the uh, has been the executive director of the American Lighthouse Foundation, based in Maine now for for quite a few years. Uh, founded it along with Dan McFadden, is that right, who was a former Coast Guard keeper? Yes, that's correct. Mm -hmm. I, I know that when uh, the organization was founded, the lighthouse was in pretty rough shape. Y yes, it was. Like back in 2002 when the foundation uh, took over, the, the windows were boarded up and, you know, the, the DCB-36 was in pieces. There was a lot of lead paint that had to be removed. So uh, there was a lot of work to do in those early years. Around how many volunteers do you have, and are you looking for more volunteers? 
Yeah, um, it's I don't know the exact number, uh, but I'd say we probably have a pool of about 25 to 30 volunteers. Mm -hmm. uh, they don't all go out at every trip, but, uh, you know, many of them make as many trips as possible. And we're always looking for more. Absolutely. And what kind of you mentioned painting, but are there <laughs> other other tasks as well you need volunteers for? Uh, they can sweep floors, uh, do dusty. <laughs> one one project that we have uh, that we would like to do in the in the near future is to have the the floors refinished on the upper levels. They're beautiful white pine floors. They're in very good shape, but they would look really great if they were refinished. So mm -hmm. at some point, we like to, we hope we can get someone to volunteer their their time and expertise um, to refinish the floors. So yeah. let me ask you, uh, obviously, there's a need to raise a lot more money. Uh, hopefully, I would, I would think uh, grants might be in order, but grants are not necessarily so easy to come by these days. We're finding that, yes, that's very true. <laughs> yeah, government grants have mostly dried up on all, all levels, so that's, it's really difficult. Yes. Um, you never know where uh, your next million dollars might come from. But let me just ask you, if, if individual people, if some of our listeners might want to donate, what's the best way for them to do that? Uh, the best way, uh, they can go to our webpage, DelawareBayLights.org, and uh, they'll see a, a link uh, to donate online with PayPal. Uh, our address is on our webpage. Uh, we welcome checks uh, as well as PayPal. And uh, I, I will mention we do have a campaign running through the end of the year called Cash for the Case on, and there is a link to contribute to that as well. One project we have uh, uh, for the near future is repairs to the concrete base that surrounds the, the light. It is crumbling pretty rapidly, and, and we need uh, to have repairs done to that. So um, anybody that uh, donates to that at $100 or more will also be included on a, a plaque that we're going to hang inside the light to, to show our appreciation. We, we also do have a, a, a Facebook page that folks can go to and donate from there. Could you just mention the, the website again? Yes, it's uh, DelawareBayLights.org. So let me ask you one more question for bonus points. Mm -hmm. What is your favorite part personally about your involvement with Harbor of Refuge Lighthouse? I would have to say that uh, taking the public out on tours of the light, we, we get to show them all the hard work we've done. You know, it, you can tell they're having a great time. Ask, they ask a lot of questions. So it, it's very rewarding to take people out to show, show them the light. That's got to be my uh, favorite part of it. I remember uh, one time when I was at a lighthouse in New Bedford, Massachusetts, a spark plug, you know, offshore caisson mm -hmm. where you have to take a boat to get to it. And mm -hmm. the guy who was like the lead volunteer, uh, I have him on video saying this. This was over 20 years ago. But he, he said, uh, I said, how do you get people interested in this? And he said, all you have to do is come out here once and experience this. And uh, I imagine that's that would apply to Harbor of Refuge Lighthouse as well. It, I, I would definitely agree with that. It's very true. Rick Ziegler, I really appreciate you spending this time with me today, and uh, your organization has just done, done such a tremendous job, and you face, uh, there's no doubt about it, you're going to face a, an uphill battle to get that work on the breakwater done, but will, where there's a will, there's a way, I think, in this, this case, so, uh, you know, I'm, I'm pulling for you, as a lot of people are. And uh, again, I appreciate you talking to me today and wish you all the luck in the world. Yes, thank you, Jeremy. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. Thanks to Rick Ziegler for today's interview. You can learn more about the Delaware River and Bay Lighthouse Foundation online at DelawareBayLights.org. Now we're going to have our second installment of Photography Tips with Mike Leonard. Yes, we are. We had the first one a few weeks ago, and we'll continue having Mike back now and then to share his expertise with us. Mike Leonard lives in Yarmouth, Maine. His photography is frequently seen in books and magazines and in television segments. His work has been seen nationally on the Weather Channel and on the National Geographic Wild program. Mike offers workshops on digital photography, which you can read about on his website at phototourismbymike.com. 
Let's listen to this installment of Photo Tips with Mike Leonard now. I am speaking today with my good friend and great photographer, Mike Leonard. We're uh, gonna have the second installment of Photo Tips with Mike Leonard. And Mike, I understand I'm actually speaking to you in Chicago right now, rather than at your home in Maine, so that's a little different, but thank you so much for joining us. Yeah. This is true. It's the magic of technology, Jeremy. <laughs> yeah, we're speaking via Skype. And I understand today the subject that you're, you want to talk about is something that all of us, anybody who does digital photography, we deal with memory cards, but we don't necessarily give them the attention and, and care they deserve. So I think this is a great subject, and I understand you're going to give us some tips uh, to do with memory cards. Absolutely. I was on a cruise, a lighthouse cruise, as a matter of fact, a couple of weeks ago and saw this uh, lady put a new memory card into her camera and she was about to start shooting. And I said, wait a moment, you need to format that first. And she looked at me with the most puzzled look. Format? What do you mean by that? She's just always put the camera, uh, put the card into the camera and let it go. You can certainly do that but it's not the proper way to do it. To format a memory card, let's back up one. Let's think about a blank piece of paper, for instance. Now, if you were to take a sheet of paper out of your printer, for instance, that's just gonna be a white blank sheet of paper. And I call that unformatted. Now, let's think about note paper or lined paper or even graph paper that arguably you could say is blank, but you would be writing on it and the lines would help you or even in a case of a, a graph paper maybe you put each letter in each box kind of like a IRS form or some sort of a form where you have to put letters into a specific uh, location well I call that formatted and it's important to do for a couple of reasons first of all you always want to format the card in the camera and it's so easy to do it literally takes seconds in fact in some cases you'll probably go put the put the memory card in the camera search for the tools to find the format option you'll to choose format it'll ask you are you sure you want to do this because this is going to wipe everything off the card it's going to bring it right back to zero and you want to say yes and so then once you've done that in some cases it goes so fast you wonder if it even worked and you'll actually want to go and format it a second time just to watch the little barcode you know go zipping across uh, but you only need to do it once and what that does is it simply readies the card to receive images from your camera so when you take a picture your camera wants to logically put that data into a respective memory slot that you create on the card and you do that by formatting. Now, my workflow is such that I will put a card in, I will format that card, then I'll go ahead and I'll do a photo shoot, whatever it is I might be taking pictures of. When I'm done, I take the card out of the camera, I put it into a memory card reader, and I copy that off to my hard drive in my computer. And I always am a firm believer of backups, so it doesn't go to just one hard drive. It goes to a second one and then sometimes even a third. And that's how I get good sleep at night is when it's in at least two places. <laughs> and then I take that memory card out and I put it back in the camera and then I format it again. Now that completely erases the card and preps it to receive images again. Now, a couple of points. You never want to format the card in the computer. Uh, you can end up with corrupted files if you do that. And you don't want to go and delete the images on the card, um, only to then go ahead and start using that card again, because uh, when you delete an image, it leaves breadcrumbs behind, if you will. And that's not always good. Now, here's one more consideration. There's a reason they call these flashcards is because sometimes you might run into a scenario that the 
card could get corrupted. Well, there are programs that you can download to help you recover files. If you have a formatted card with images onto that card, your odds of retrieving images go up exponentially versus if you don't have a formatted card. Think of a stud finder. I bet you may even have one, Jeremy, that you can move along the wall to find where the two by fours are behind like a sheetrock. Yep. And if you know that those two by fours are a certain number of inches apart, all you need to do is to find one of them. And then with a ruler, you can find pretty much the rest. Well, when you go to undelete a memory card, it looks for a grouping of data on the card that constitutes a photo. And then it says, okay, the next photo should logically be in the next slot and the next slot and so on. Again, think of a piece of graph paper. Well, if you don't format the memory card, all the images might be there, but when you go to recover it, you might not get back the whole images. Oftentimes what I've seen is you might get just the top half of an image or just the bottom half of an image. Basically, it'll all be corrupted. Mm -hmm. and you don't get it all back. I've had to undelete at least a dozen memory cards in my lifetime, and I can tell you with some assurance that every card that's been formatted the way that I've just described, I was able to 100% recover. The cards that I was not able to get the images back intact were ones that the card had not been formatted. So again, it's a very simple step to do you want to do it with every card, and you want to do it before you start taking pictures. That's the uh, message for today. Um, one other last note, memory cards are not all the same. Most cameras use SD cards, and I know there's still some that use CF cards, and then Sony's got some other higher speed cards that are out there. Um, but back to the SD cards, I would rather have a high-speed memory card as opposed to a slow-speed memory card. And what does that mean? Well, when you take a picture, the next thing you want to be able to do is to take another picture. And if you're having to wait for your camera to put that photo onto the memory card, you might miss taking the next picture. That's where a high-speed memory card will help you. And it will also help you when offloading the images. If you have a high-speed memory card reader, which I recommend, you can put your memory card into it, copy it all into your computer at a much higher rate of speed than if you have a slow memory card. The easiest way to tell what kind of memory card you've got or the speed of the card is to look at the class number. Some you might see a, the letter C with like a 4 in the middle. That's a slow card. But like a C10 or something that might have a U with a 1 or a U3, for instance, very high-speed cards. And those are the cards you need if you're going to be recording video. Because if you think of video, you're taking upwards of 30 pictures every second. That's a lot of throughput. So that's where you need the higher-speed card. You're not going to get better quality, per se. It's all that, that's all the same. But what you are going to get is faster turnaround, and you'll maybe be able to make a shot that otherwise, if your camera is busy writing, you might miss something. Mm -hmm. So that's especially important if you're out on one of these cruises and we happen to see a whale surface. <laughs> so you absolutely uh, want to be able to be ready for, uh, for the unknown. I've definitely had that happen where my card was a little on the slow side. I remember uh, one time taking pictures during a storm of Whaleback Lighthouse in Kittery, Maine from shore. And there were a wave, the lighthouse is 70 feet tall. There were waves hitting the rocks and going up over the top of the lighthouse. My, I was taking pictures so fast, my card was having trouble keeping up with it. And as a result of that, I missed one wave that went about twice the height of the lighthouse. And, wow. you know, I'll never get that back. So, uh, you know, now I, if I buy new cards, I always look for the, the faster cards. I often give an example of, you. let's say you have a choice of a 32-gig card or a 64-gig card, and they're both the same price. The 32-gig card is a Class 10 card, but the 64-gig card 
double the capacity is only a class four. Well, which one are you going to buy? And for me, I'd be buying that 32 gig one, the smaller one, if it's the same price. Because if you think of it this way, a parking lot can hold several hundred cars. So can the turnpike. The difference is in the parking lot, those several hundred cars at most are maybe going two or three miles an hour. On the turnpike, they're doing 65 or 70. So you always want the higher speed when you have that option. And most of today's cameras will enterprise on that and give you a much better performance by having the higher speed cards. I think we should mention your website at this point, which is? Phototourismbymike.com. I know that's a mouthful. Well, that's <laughs> not so bad. Phototourismbymike.com. Yeah. And if people have questions for you, can they contact you? Is your contact information on the website there? Yes, there is a way to reach me through the website. And I'd welcome anybody who might have any questions about cards or anything that we've talked about on these programs to reach out to me that way. You can also see a list of upcoming events that I hope to be populating that sometime in the next couple of months uh, for photography events and photo cruises and your favorite lighthouse photography cruises that uh, we've got at least three, if not four, in the works for next year already. So I'm hoping to be able to be uh, posting information about those uh, for the calendar year 2021. Sounds good. I sure hope we'll see each other on some of those cruises next year. We're uh, all keeping our fingers and toes crossed at this point, but let's uh, think positive for next year. So, uh, Mike, I, I want to thank you for joining me again, and uh, we'll be doing more of these segments in the future, and they're always super helpful. You know, I've been doing photography a long time, but sometimes you get in bad habits, and uh, I think your instructions, your tips help us uh, maybe get out of some of those bad habits. So they're extremely useful to anybody, I think. Well, th thank you, Jeremy. And, and it's certainly something that applies to anybody with any kind of a digital camera. Even the phones that will accept a memory card, uh, one of the options in there is to format the card. So before you start putting apps and photos and stuff onto that card, if you put one of these into your Android-type phone or the Google Pixel or any of those that accept cards, look for the format option. Do that first, and uh, you'll be all set. Sounds good. Well, thank you again, Mike Leonard, so much. And again, phototourismbymike.com. People want to look at your events and uh, ask you any questions. Thank you very much, Mike. Thank you for this opportunity, Jeremy. Thank you to all the staff, volunteers, and members of the U.S. Lighthouse Society and its affiliates and chapters. To learn more about the Society, go to uslhs.org. And if you enjoy this podcast, please consider a membership or a donation to the Society. I'm gonna let it shine. That's right. This podcast and all the preservation and education that the U.S. Lighthouse Society has been doing since 1984 would not be possible without donations from people around the country. And there are also regional lighthouse organizations all around the United States. If you love lighthouses, please consider a donation to one or more of your favorite organizations. If you listen to this podcast using Apple Podcasts, please rate and review us. And if you're involved in preserving any kind of history, keep up the good work. That's right, we're all on the same team. As always, thanks for listening and keep a good light. Oh.